This is an MPB Think Radio podcast. To hear previous shows, visit mpbonline.org or download the MPB Public Radio app to listen on your iPhone or Android phone on demand. From MPB Think Radio, this is Creature Comforts. It's the show all about your animals and the animals around you. Kevin Farrell here with Dr. Troy Major, veterinarian at the Animal Medical Center in Jackson, and Libby Hartfield, retired director of the Mississippi Museum of Natural Science. Today on the show, we'll welcome master naturalist Robin Whitfield. As an ecologist, naturalist, and artist, Robin helps people of all ages to better appreciate the natural world with workshops and beautiful art pieces. We'll talk about her work and her stewardship at the Lee Tart Nature Preserve. Also, Dr. Major and Libby are here for pet questions and recent encounters with nature. So join our conversation this morning with your phone call. The number is one eight seven seven mpb ring It's one eight seven seven. 672-7464. You can email animals at mpbonline.org. If you ever miss Creature Comforts on Thursday, it repeats Saturday mornings at 6. So good morning, Libby. Let's uh, start with you. Uh, what have you been observing in your part of the world lately? Oh, gosh. I've talked about... I, it, it. It's turned out to be all about birds this week, of course, <laughs> yeah. which is usually not true at my house. We're usually into the bugs and the creepy crawlers, but uh, the prothonotary warblers are back, and um, I have a female now. I think I talked about it. I had two males around, and now I saw a female this morning, so things are get busy now. And uh, the perulas, I've been hearing them. I still I haven't found where they've picked to nest this year, so I've got to watch for that. But rose-breasted grosbeaks have been the big visitors. I've had two appearances of males, and I think now maybe three or four uh, days of females. And, you know, it's hard to tell if it's the same female or a different one coming each day, but they're really fun, uh, something for people to watch for. And they are a bird that will come to your feeder, and they don't nest around here. They just pass through. So when it seems like when one of us start, you know, one bird watcher starts seeing them, everybody else starts seeing them. So um, I had friends come over yesterday to, or day before yesterday just to see them. Uh, indigo buntings are back. And they're great to watch. They're the the bluer of the bluebirds, I guess, is how you could put it. A lot of people say, I've got a different kind of bluebird, or my bluebirds are bluer than usual. And I say, they're, they're probably indigo buntings. And uh, the blue grosbeaks are also around, and that's uh, kind of fun to – it's a, like a bigger version of an indigo bunting. So look for those. Hummingbirds everywhere. And um, – a couple of things from our friends. I thought about you. This is the last week for the computer game exhibit at the Natural Science Museum. So if you want to go by one more time. Uh, I went last Thursday and probably go back today if I have time to walk on the trails and visit the dinosaurs. The new dinosaurs are out on the trails. Robin, I don't know if you've seen that. No, I knew that was coming. Yeah, they're they're pretty cool. And the fun thing is to watch the kids watch the dinosaurs oh, yeah. as they come upon them. Have you had yours over to see them yet? You guys are going to have to walk those trails because they're just kind of like one of them's laying them down in the bushes. Kinda. No, they don't. They don't pop out, do they? <laughs> well, no, they, and they don't make any noise. Okay, so they're okay, not okay. scary. Right. And like I say, the, like there's one big one that's laying down in the bushes in the greenery, and you can see them from far enough away that kids have a chance to get used to. But some kids you can see are not sure if this is a real thing right. or not, and <laughs> you know the three year olds are kind of sneaking up on them. So it's it's pretty cute. And at the Clinton Nature Center tonight, I told Robin if I got out of here without <laughs> saying it, her mom's a big member right, and on right. board. The Clinton Nature Center, uh, Dr. Jana Thomas, who is new to Mississippi College, and she's doing the program tonight at 6 o'clock called What's in Your Pond. So I'm going to try to go by there, too. And there's a component this time of the lecture for children. So bring the kids with you. All right. And then one more that's sort of on the sad or cautionary news, avian influenza. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you've heard about it, too. Mm -hmm. And um, it's been um, confirmed in Alabama. Mm -hmm. And we might want, maybe this is a good seg over to um, Troy. 
he'll know more about it than me, but it's particularly a problem if you've got home chickens or pet birds, Mm. and it can be carried by wild birds. And so if we get a warning that we should take in our feeders, let's all do that to help squash this. So I've I've not taken mine down yet, uh, but that we may get to that point where mm-hmm. we need to do it. I, I, last night there was some chatter online of some of the uh, other bird feeders. So if you feed birds in your yard, kind of um, every now and then you might Google avian influenza and see what's happening. And um, I'd like to hear what Troy's got to add to it. We'll go to Dr. Major in a minute, but yeah, that yeah. Uh, actually, w- there was a story on NPR yesterday about the this new bird flu. Uh, a lot of uh, domestic birds uh, being uh, called, uh, either have the flu or they're calling them to prevent the spread. But as you mentioned, uh, it's also affecting uh, wild birds. Um, this brings up a question. Is it a good idea, even out, other than the bird flu, to regularly feed your, I'm sorry, clean your feeders? Definitely clean your feeders. Uh, hummingbird feeders, you know, if you see any mildew, mold-looking little black specks in there, clean it off. But you got to be real careful using soap on the hummingbird feeders because they're very, you know, you can kill a hummingbird with soap. Uh, just like you can with the mildew. So uh, a, a little weak bleak solu- bleach solution, soak your hummingbird feeders is what I do, and then let them completely air dry. Let all that evaporate and maybe still rinse it out a little bit. But uh, And there's some good instructions online about it. And your, your wooden feeders particularly need to be cleaned good. And um, sometimes set out in the sunshine, bright sunshine, if you can take them apart. Those that can be washed are um, really good to have because you do need to keep it particularly clean. There are other things that birds can get. You know, there's always been some discussion, and there are always a few ornithologists that say, you know, feeding birds is not always a good idea. It's something we do for ourselves as much as for the birds. Uh, so that we can bring them into a close distance to mm-hmm. observe them, and we need to be really careful that we don't abuse that that privilege mm-hmm. of watching the birds. Keep them healthy. So, uh, good morning, Dr. Major. Got a couple of pet emails for you, but first, uh, do you have you heard anything and any information on this uh, the bird flu? You know, the, the bird flu certainly can be a serious economic uh, uh, event as far as the domestic birds. Uh, I don't know how many of you are old enough to remember in California. Uh, they had an outbreak uh, years ago and actually were culling uh, individual uh, chickens, you know, for, whether they were uh, there for I'm talking about neighborhoods now. But I think they've already uh, euthanized quite a few birds up in the Midwest, and it does seem to be spreading here. I certainly agree with uh, Libby that we need to keep our feeders uh, clean. Uh, the uh, hummingbirds are very sensitive, as she noted, but the other feeders also are important to clean them regularly. All right, a couple of emails for you here. This first one says, I adopted a puppy who's now seven month, months old. He weighs about 22 pounds and looks a lot like a schnauzer. Is this a normal weight for that type of dog at this age? I'm just trying to see how big he'll be uh, when he's fully grown. If he's a schnauzer-like dog, uh, I would suspect that probably, unless he gets overweight, probably 25 to 30 pounds would be maximum. If he's seven months old now and weighs 22 I can't imagine this puppy getting over 30, so I would say that would be the range as a guess. <laughs> okay. All right. Uh, and it's important to keep health, uh, keep pets at a healthy weight, so is it the, just looking at them? Can we tell maybe if a pet is, is beginning to get to be too heavy, or what are some ways to help monitor our pet's weight? Absolutely. And, of course, uh, overfeeding is always an issue, but also there are some medical conditions that can cause weight gain. Uh, one of the things that you can do with your own dog is run your hand down the back. You should be able to feel the very tips of the vertebra. You don't want the dog to be bony, but at the same time, you should be able to feel those tips. And also, you should be able to feel the ribs. Uh, they start to get a covering of, uh, of uh, fat uh, over the ribs pretty quickly. So, it's And you'd like to be, if you look down on the dog, uh, from the top, you'd like to see a little waist rather than just a cube, if you will. 
So those are some things that you can do at home just to kind of judge. Uh, and keeping weight records are important because it and it might vary, but if you all of a sudden you see a gain of four or five pounds, you know this may be uh, a tip that we're getting obese. And certainly if your pet does have a, a weight problem, that's something that you can work with your vet to, to help control. Absolutely. Uh, there are foods that can help. And, you know, one of the simplest things to do is to cut back on the amount and to avoid feeding table food, uh, scraps, this sort of thing. But uh, you can control most of the weight gain by reducing the amount if, in fact, uh, we're beginning to get overweight. And also resist uh, the dogs baking for table scraps, maybe, although I guess for some folks that might be harder to do than others. Listen, their cats are cats are big, too, so they, 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 uh, they all can uh, train us, if you will, uh, and try to resist that. Uh, one of the things that I've found in some cases works is to have a little small bowl of kibble uh, at the table. If you really want to feed the dog from the table, feed it some of his own kibble uh, as a treat uh, while you're eating. It's better not to do that, but it does help in some cases. All right, here's another one. It says, I'm bottle feeding a three-week-old orphan puppy. Is it all right to add some rice or oatmeal baby cereal to the milk? I guess it depends on what kind of uh, dog this is. You know, uh, there's a lot of difference between a three-week-old chihuahua and a three-week-old Rottweiler. Uh, So a lot of the dogs will begin to eat uh, soft, uh, softened kibble if you will, at, uh, at about four weeks, some even earlier. Um, but there's nothing wrong with adding uh, a little supplement, a little uh, food to that diet uh, in that three-week-old puppy. All right. And can a puppy contract heartworms if their mother has them? Okay. Heartworms are not going to be spread by the mother. Uh, they're spread by mosquitoes. And certainly if the mother has heartworms, Mosquitoes can feed on her, uh, can go through a stage in the mosquito, and they can bite the puppy and or other dogs as well and infect them with heartworms. So that's why you... uh, Go ahead. Mosquito mosquito is critical uh, in the spread. And I know you reminded us uh, quite frequently to make sure that that heartworm medication is given to your, your dog on a regular basis. Correct. It needs to be given pretty much on schedule. It's time for our first break of the hour. When we get back, we'll welcome to the show our guest, Robin Whitfield. We'll talk about her art and its connection to the natural world, also about her role at the Lee Tart Nature Preserve, so stay tuned. Dr. Major will stay on hand, ready for pet questions. Call with questions and comments to this number, 1-877-MPB-RING. It's 1-877-672-7464. You can email animals at mpbonline.org. Back with more after this. On Southern Remedy Healthy and Fit, you get information about foods you should eat to stay in good health and tips on how to stay active. I'm Dr. Josie Bidwell, host of Southern Remedy Healthy and Fit and Associate Professor of Preventive Medicine at the University of Mississippi Medical Center. Listen to the show every Monday at 11 or subscribe to the podcast by searching for Southern Remedy with your preferred podcasting app. We're back on Creature Comforts on MPB Think Radio. Kevin Farrell here with Dr. Troy Major and Libby Hartfield. If you want to join our conversation with a question or comment this morning, call us at one eight seven seven mpb ring Our phone number is one 672 7464 You can email the show by sending it to animals at mpbonline.org. So, Libby, before we dig into things, you had a good point as we talked about mosquitoes and spreading heartworm. Uh, but as you said, a lot of times the mosquitoes in our yard might be our own fault. Yep, that's true. It's that those... Um a bucket that's collected rainwater, and we've had rain every week, at least one day lately, huh? So or an old flower pot, or, you know, a, a dish that the dog's been drinking out of, anything like that where you've got standing water, it only takes a day or so, and mosquitoes, the wigglers are in there. Mm-hmm. So dump that water out regularly, and a bird baths are a a bad source for growing mosquitoes. I I have a problem. In fact, we've got a pond on site. Now, a pond is 
not nearly as bad as a dish or something like that. If you've got fish and you've got other invertebrates in it, you've got a food chain going, and everything likes to eat a wiggling mosquito. So <laughs> it, they don't they don't really stand as big a chance in a pond or a creek as they do in a an untended bucket kind of a thing. So watch for that. If you have a bird bath, are there ways to help with mosquito control? Um, if in the hot summer, what I've always been told is every day if you're watering something with your hose, always shoot it in your uh, in your bird bath and you know knock all the old water out, keep it circulating, that kind of a thing. But if you'll dump it out every two or three days and add fresh water, which you probably should do anyway, <laughs> because you know other things can grow in there that are not good for your birds anyway. So. Yeah, you do have to watch it. And a lot of people will use water drippers, and you can even make them themselves out of, you know, punching a hole in a, a gallon uh, milk jug or something because birds really like to get under moving water. And if you l- have water just dripping and it's dripping onto the ground or on a rock or something and it doesn't, cong- you know, doesn't gather, mm-hmm. they like to get under that dripping water, and that's an easier way to maintain it and be sure you're not getting mosquitoes okay got a couple calls on the line so let's start uh, in raymond anthony has called in today anthony good morning you're on the air with us so go ahead hey libby and robin uh this is anthony Thaxton. how are you guys doing good to hear good. you uh i just i have a quick comment and then i wanted to ask uh robin a question um now libby we we love you and i <laughs> talked to your daughter years ago just wonderful people appreciate what you do and robin gosh okay you've got <laughs> guest on today uh last year uh on the walter anderson documentary that we did we we saw where walter anderson robin's comment on that film about him digging deep into one area was just so wonderful and robin is like the successor of that she is <laughs> dug deep up there in in her area around grenada and we are so proud of the work she does and if you don't know robin's art you need to look it up robin whitfield she's just a wonderful but here's here's my question uh robin in your area in your swamp you know uh, what what kind of creatures I, I grew up uh you know going trot lining and all of that in the swamp areas uh, and we saw snakes and things, but what are some of the most interesting creatures you encounter as you dig deep and you're out in your swamp all the time and you're there uh, in ways that other people aren't? What are some of the creatures that you come across there in, in that area? Um, well, I must confess, right now, I'm a plant lover first. So I'm always looking for plants. But, you know, this is where you cannot separate plants from critters. When I, I've become interested in insects and birds and things in the water because I discovered them eating the plant and I'm loving that relationship. But some of the things that have been most interesting to me are aquatic Um I have the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service um, biologist Becky Roseman come out sometimes to help me with education, and she puts them in a traps in the water. And what we pull out is just, I just thought fish lived in there, I did, and frogs. I didn't think beyond that. And so the eastern newt is one of the, that's one of the most common animals we catch. It's a, you know, I think of newts as something from Shakespeare. You know, I don't, <laughs> I didn't even know that was a, a just an aquatic salamander, and they're bright yellow with little black specks they're just absolutely stunningly beautiful and i can only you know and i don't see them unless i'm trying to catch them with that minute trap and so it's magical when i have that opportunity and I, I, oddly enough i don't see many snakes hardly ever and um, that's usually a surprise to people but i love finding a snake um it's usually a water snake and some sort of banded water snake or, or something you know catches my little color and pattern in, in the water but um <clears throat> birds are the other thing that if you don't go out to a wild play, I mean, birds at your feeder, we've been talking about this morning, you're going to see certain birds at your feeder, but a lot of the birds that I see, I didn't even know existed until I started getting very, when I'm quietly painting in the swamp, the the birds don't really notice me. And I, I had a hermit thrush uh, uh, light right in front of my face just a few days ago, waggle his little tail and beat his little wings. I think he saw me and he didn't know what I was. And I felt like he was trying to ask me a question, like, who are you? you know? <laughs> he was very curious, but that... I never knew a hermit thrush existed until about five years ago. And just they're one of my favorite birds now because they'll be curious. Oh, they're really cute. 
have to brag on Anthony. He didn't introduce himself. No, he did not. The most, yes. Uh, he's recently produced a, a, a new film on Walter Anderson that um, if you've not seen it, you need to see it. And it is, I think it's shown regularly on, on um, MPB. Mm-hmm. I'd also like to add, he also made an amazing book to go with that that is just an absolute pleasure. Every time I look in that book, I find something new. I know Anthony Anthony told me enough about the deep research he went to find paintings no one had seen and drawings and just talking with all the children of Walter Anderson. Just amazing. Well, you can't find a better naturalist uh, than, than Walter Anderson. But, no. And thank you guys for the comments. Those were not, and they can watch the film on uh, the PBS uh, viewer as well. But uh, but Robin, you uh, you definitely. I mean, out of all my lifetime in studying art, I, and I mean, Rob, uh, Walter Anderson, I guess in my opinion is just the most genuine, most uh, immersed artist that I've ever come in contact with and know about. And Robin, you were you were the second most. <laughs> wow, Anthony, that's so uh, I, wow. Thank but I you. Just want to say hello and 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 uh, thank you for the information on the swamp there. That's awesome. I appreciate Keep it. <laughs> All right, uh, Anthony, thanks for calling in. And while we're on the subject of, uh, of Walter Anderson, the museum down in Ocean Springs, I think, is a must-see. Just some great stuff in there. And Definitely. The mural there in, in the auditorium is just amazing. So uh, if, if you're on the coast and want to uh, take a trip to Ocean Springs, uh, please include the Walter Anderson Museum uh, on your itinerary. Let's get another call in here. Uh, Angie from Mobile, I think, has a question for Dr. Major. Angie, go ahead, please. Um, good morning, everyone. Thank you for taking my call. Um, I was calling because I have a 13-year-old, 50-pound um, pit bull mix, and she doesn't whine or anything, but just because she's getting older, I'm just, you know, like wondering if she has maybe some arthritis or something like that. And I was wanting to know, what are some natural kind of home remedies that I can uh give to her it's a great question and you know chances are at her age uh yes she probably does have some arthritis is she overweight um the vet says she's good she's 50 pounds okay okay i guess the things that she can think of would be things that you might use now you know glucosamine works in some uh animals glucosamine and uh, chondroitin uh, I don't know if you've tried that or not. It's uh, kind of an over-the-counter medication. The other thing would be the uh, fish oil, fatty acids. Uh, that can help in some cases with arthritis, and it's also very good for skin as well if there's a skin issue. So that's given orally. Uh, you can put it on our food, and that would help. As far as other things, uh, we're somewhat limited uh, as in what you can give, but certainly if you've not tried the glucosamine chondroitin combination, I would certainly try that. How much should I give her? She weighs 50 pounds. It depends on the concentration that you get, but somewhere in 1,000 milligram, I think would be uh, 500 to 1,000 milligrams uh, once or twice. A day? Yes. Okay. Let's try that and see, and good luck, and I hope that helps her. Okay. All right, Angie. Yeah, and Go. one more, one more uh, quick thing. Um, I took her to the vet, and they said that um, she may have um, a fungus or something on her foot. So I've been, I bought some over-the-counter stuff that's antibacterial, antifungal, and I've been uh, spraying her paws with it. But Does that um, help? they still look a little red. And I'm just wondering, is it just because um, she's usually outside while I'm at work? So I'm just right. wondering, like, is it just because she's always on her feet? Or do I really need to, like, wrap her feet or something like that? I think it would be counterproductive to wrap her feet. Uh, certainly, uh, she may be allergic to something in the yard, whether it's grass. And, and dogs, just like cats, they lick and groom. Uh, they lick her feet quite a bit. Uh, if she doesn't have any sores or anything like that, I'd suggest a good vitamin supplement that has zinc in it and uh, see if that might help uh, with her with her feet. 
Okay. Thank you guys so much. I love your show. Have a good day. Thanks, Angie, for your call. This is Creature Comforts on MPB Think Radio. Our guest today is Robin Whitfield. So, Robin, tell us a little bit about your background and how you came to have such an appreciation and, and a connection to nature. Um, you know, I ask myself that a lot, but I'm going to have to... Uh I'm going to have to just go back to Walter Anderson and the fact that my mother is an art teacher and an artist. And um, she, I grew up with her taking us down to the coast. And my first idea of what an artist was was Walter Anderson. Like, that was one of the first artists I, I ever knew um, at that level. And, um, and so that, that, that planted a seed, I'm sure. that he, you know, I lo- And I loved being outside. And uh, my, my family was the kind of family that we grew up in Clinton and kind of in, in a suburban environment. And so... I didn't have complete access to nature, but what I had access to, I dove in deeply. It's like almost when you don't have access, you pre- when we would go on family trips to a state park, which we camped when we went on family trips, I would be overwhelmed with, oh my goodness, there's a creek and a, a real creek or a real, it was like you know, all these like things almost had superstar status to me because I just didn't have access, easy access. And so I didn't know what anything was, and but I would just immerse myself and you know, it kind of, I've always been prone to being... I guess sensitive to beauty, or, or I don't, I don't, you know, maybe, yeah, I don't, you know, I guess that's kind of how I feel like I, I'm an artist is that I've always noticed colors and shapes and things like that first. And being a very shy child, I kind of wanted to be by myself. And so I think all those things wrapped together have, have kind of fused this. I felt very comfortable in nature. Uh, and I've, you know, sometimes nature just means sitting under a tree in your yard. That's what it was to me as a child or going to my grandmother's garden. And as I got older and more comfortable, I, you know, I could go further and further away from a road or from some known place and feel more at ease there than in any shopping mall there where there was, like where all my peers wanted to be. And um, so I think that was kind of a, a beginning for me. This is Creature Comforts on MPB Think Radio. Time for another break. When we get back, we'll continue talking with artist Robin Whitfield. We'll talk more about her art, but we also want to get in uh, to the Lee Tart Nature Preserve in Grenada. Dr. Major will stay on the line ready for your pet questions. Levy always likes to hear your recent encounters with nature. So give us a call. The number is 1-877-MPB-RING. Our phone number is one 672 7464 You can email animals at mpbonline.org. Stay tuned. Deep South Dining is the show all about the culture of Southern flavor. From fried chicken and collard greens to shrimp and grits and a glass of sweet tea. Subscribe now to the podcast using any podcast app or download our MPB public media app. Kevin Farrell here on Creature Comforts with Dr. Troy Major, veterinarian at the Animal Medical Center in Jackson, and Libby Hartfield, retired director of the Mississippi Museum of Natural Science. Our guest for the hour is naturalist and artist Robin Whitfield. If you want to join the conversation, you can give us a call. The number is one eight seven seven mpb ring It's one 672 7464 You can email animals at mpbonline.org. So, Robin, I, we had you on the show, and again, the older I get, my brain gets very addled, and I don't remember exactly when it was. But one of the coolest things I thought was that that you incorporated natural materials in, in your art. If you would, tell us a little bit about that. Yeah. <clears throat> so, um, just to give you know, the listeners a slight background, I mean, I grew up in an artistic home. I studied painting at Delta State and kind of just went the regular route. But I never really thought about what paint was or what materials were, and... Uh, just one particular moment, I, you know, I, went, I ended up leaning into watercolor the most because it's easy to, to take out into the wild. But one particular moment, I was uh, I was out in my kayak actually painting, and um, and my paper blew over into the water. And when I picked it up, it was covered in the, the you know I'm going to call it swamp scum. I now know it's the oils of trees mostly. <laughs> they you know decaying leaves and all the oils. The most beautiful brown I'd ever seen was on the surface of my paper, covering my painting. But I, th- I didn't mind because it was phenomenal. I was like, oh, nature has colors that can get on my paper. And then you know, immediately I'm like, why have I never considered, you know, we've all, all cultures throughout all of history have only, have, have only had, had access to pigments where they live. Because, you know, you didn't have Amazon and Walmart and, and whatever. So 
I, you know, I started trying every, this is probably 15 years ago. I started trying every color mineral and plant, berry, leaves, funguses. My sketchbook just became full of, ooh, what might this be? And it comes to find out, you know, pig, plant pigments especially are, are, are is chemical. And so a lot of the times it's like magic. You put like a berry, like elderberry in particular, you rub it on the paper and it looks purple and give it a little bit of time, maybe some oxygen mixing in, get it, it gets oxidized and it becomes kind of blue. You know, you, you, you drop some water on it, it becomes real blue. And I mean, it's kind of become fairly magical to me to think about natural pigments being created by a location itself. And so it's kind of like a palette of a place. And so... I don't know, it's just becoming a, a way to enter into a relationship with an actual place. And um, that's a lot. I do workshops a lot around the state. The, 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 the Museum of Natural Science has me some. And, uh, and I invite people now to, I use it as a way to, ex, to remember to have a sense of wonder when I'm painting with watercolor. That's how I kind of u- use that um, natural pig. I don't always put it in the paintings I sell because it's... Um, Pigments from plants in particular will change over time and eventually just become brown. They're a living, almost a living pigment, you know. And for me, as a, as a person who does sell their art, I have to remind myself I'm not trying to make paintings to sell. I paint to have an experience with nature and my paintings. I think of that as a little bit more of a byproduct that I will sell and I want to sell because I want my, my paintings to to impact people's view of nature. The way Walter Anderson has done for me, I'd like to think that I can maybe do that for others, maybe about wetlands. But what natural pigments can do, I think, for me, it keeps me playful, child It's like I think anyone can start playing, mushing a berry on a piece of paper or and add a little dirt in there, look at a flower. Maybe when you sting a thousand times but never... When you, when you put a rose petals and crush them into paper, you would be amazed at the color purple you're going to get. It's not red like you think. It's just, it delights you in, in ways I cannot explain. And I see everyone become delighted when playing with, with things. And to me, that is a way to enter into a relationship and even forget and remind yourself that we all are creative beings. You know, not just, I'm an artist and I call myself that, but we're actually all humans are creative. Do you have a favorite spot to to paint that maybe you feel kind of helps spark your creativity? Um, I mean, I, I, it's more and more I spend more and more time at Lee Tart Nature Preserve because it's uh, a few blocks from my studio in Grenada. It's it's amazing that I can have access to this three hundred acre wetland uh, right down the street, and I've I've also gotten to where I, I like I can sit under one tree for an entire day and watch birds and insects and and. Anything I've seen dung beetles, and um, that's one of the most fascinating things. Also, I guess back to Anthony's question, dung beetles. I didn't know that was a thing. But if you're just quietly sitting there, so I can, I, I've gotten to where I just kind of go to one place where I used to. Public land is very important to me as a painter, and I think it should should be very important to all of us because it's open to our imagination, and we all have access to it. So I go to public land to paint, um, and uh, Lee Tart Nature Preserve is owned by the city of Grenada, and it is managed by my nonprofit, Friends of Chachuma Swamp. But I feel, you know, particularly connected to that place, and I got there through painting. I started painting there before it had a name, and um, and I guess re- created this relationship with that place, and continue to go there on a daily basis and sketch and paint, and just just so I can better see it and, and connect with it. So folks are listening, would you have some tips as to how they could make art with children, maybe especially incorporating nature and, and outdoors? Um, yeah, I had a couple of thoughts, and I kind of want to – I'm going to mention a project I'm working on or have just recently worked on. Um, and I want to – when talking about this project, I hope it might spark an idea for a family or maybe a school or a church. So kind of back to the Walter Anderson Museum, Anthony Thaxton, who called in earlier, he and I have been working with the Walter Anderson Museum on a project um, – which will actually be the cul- their culminating event is tomorrow night at St. Martin High School. And we have been working for three years with the No Plastic, a Plastic Free Gulf Coast and the Walter Anderson Museum to do a project where they looked at microplastics. Well, my role in that was to help the students create a mural. And we went on a walk. They have these wonderful nature, nature trails. So I went down last year and then back again very just a few weeks ago, and they – Um, After my workshop, and we did kind of this gathering pigments and looking at colors, they went out on their own throughout the year and gathered 
all these different mineral pigments from around the side of the school. And they were able to find like six distinct colors. And then they, had, they got buckets full. And then we processed. We, and this is, a, look, kids really do love this. We laid all the mud. These are mud. It's basically colored mud. I mean, we don't think about our mud having colors, but we have red muds and dark brown muds and pale gray. You know, it's these are clays. So if you get all that laid out in the sun and let it dry really, really good, um, I get I, I go to like big lots and get old mort- I mean, like wooden mortars and pestles for real cheap. And that's where I've gotten like a big sets of them. Or you can go to thrift shops and you kind of want a wooden mortar and pestle with kids. But then let them put these chunks of dried earth into mortars and pestles, you know, pound and grind them into a fine powder and then run them through. I also buy old, you know, like um, strainers from thrift stores. You know, and kind of get them as fine a particle as you can through, you know, get out all the roots and rocks until you have this kind of, it looks as pure pigment, you know. They love that. They they don't even want to move on to making art with it. <laughs> they just, it's very very soothing. Every, every even the high school kids when we were doing this, they're like, "Oh my God, this feels amazing!" It's just this rhythm of pounding and grinding and pounding and grinding. So, but it was interesting to see this palette of place. So Saint Martin Height, we used those colors and created a very we a, a, I want to say twelve or fourteen foot by eight foot tall mural by painting on. Nine by 18 pieces of paper, every student, you know, actually were able to paint several sections of it, and we put them all together into this big piece. But um, it, it was just fascinating to see those beautiful, warm, earthy colors. And it's just fun to see what colors can I find when you go on a hike or in your yard and, and, and kind of see maybe those things that you've just taken for granted as, as a pigment. And um, the other thing I would also add to parents is you don't have to go out and try to be all artsy. I think you need to know about art. That's a very formal word. Being playful is the most important. Being quiet and <clears throat> being playful. I think a lot of people don't allow themselves to be quiet in nature. And I have a, something called One Tree that I also like to do with field trips. When they come to uh, Lee Tart Nature Preserve, one of the first things I do is have every student kind of go to – it's a single one single tree. They sometimes they choose their own, or I've kind of flagged them because I know they're separated from each other far enough where they can't talk to each other with the kids. The, the trees can talk to each other all day long, <laughs> but uh, they sound nice together. But um, and just and I give uh, fifteen minutes. That's a really long time for people. Sometimes if it's little kids, we'll do five minutes. But they go and sit by their tree, um, and they just listen. I ask them to listen and to look and to smell and use their five senses and. You can make a sound map. Sometimes you can kind of draw the tr- you know, circle and your trees in the middle of the circle, and you have them make a mark in this big – you envision about you know, 30 or 40 feet out from the tree or maybe 100 feet out, and they make little marks where they think they heard a sound. And then you all gather back up, and you talk about what you heard. And you don't have to know what you heard. As a parent or a teacher, you just talk about, I heard this, and it sounded like – you know, and you might know if you know about birds, that might be the Pearl of Warbler. But if you don't know, it's just fun to say that and to know that that you know, it's exciting to know that all of these. And you even talk about you, you heard a human sound and you heard it. You separate human sounds from animal sounds. But um, it, that, those are very and that gets your senses kind of honed and, and um, ready to then maybe make something more creative um, and find colors. And because you've you've opened yourself up to begin to get rid of your everyday mind into your um into your, to me, your senses are your way into your, um, where your brain can kind of get pushed to the side and you begin to notice things deeply and pay attention. We're going to be talking to Robin throughout the hour. A couple of phone calls to get to. Let's uh, start with uh, Regina, who's called in from Jackson. Good morning, J- Regina. You're on the air with us. Go ahead. Hi, I have a comment and a question. Um, can hummingbirds recognize faces? Uh, Sometimes they're over around you i have one coming to my house to my feet he hasn't come up yet he's still kind of scared and also the artists um you know when um we don't see people painting and hear musicians in mississippi now you go to the big city like new york california you have artists all on the street you don't have you don't it's not visible here and maybe that's why people a lot of times people are not interested in beauty and aesthetics mm-hmm. and nature because they don't see artists uh, performing and they can hear beauty. You can see it, but you can hear it through artists and see it through artists. And can my hummingbird recognize faces? Yeah, I'll take the hummingbird and I'll give the rest <laughs> to, to Robin, but um, I've thought the same thing you've thought. Uh, 
hummingbirds definitely get used to uh, the presence of a person. I don't know if it's our face or if it's our our demeanor or a scent or what it is about us, but I think they recognize you. Like I'm the one that goes out to um, change the nectar in the feeder. And so they will hover right by my face, like saying, hurry up, hurry up, you know, <laughs> I'd like another drink. And uh, they don't they don't go away, whereas if somebody else that's not there often comes by, they will leave for a little distance. But I think they get habituated to people in general, but I do believe that they may know individuals as this is the individual that helps me. Does, does that make sense? Is that kind of what you're looking for? <laughs> Oh, I just wanted to comment. I didn't know. I enjoy them. I, I, they come close to you because, you know, they're kind of steady. <laughs> yeah. If you're really into it and you want to do, you can. Um, I even have this little, just because it was stolen on the sold online, have a little ring, and I haven't tried it yet. You put a little bit of the sugar water in it and hold your hand out, and it's got the little flower, and supposedly I can train them to come and eat from my hand. So (laughs) I'm going to try that thing. But uh, you can go online and look for um, situations where people have done all kinds of things, where they train them to eat out of their hand. The easiest thing, and I knew a lady who got really, Maggie Bryant would do mm-hmm. that, take the, the uh, hummingbird feeder off of the hook and just hold it for a while, and it won't be too long before they will basically come to your hand and drink mm-hmm. out of that feeder that you're holding. So you might try to do that if you've got some that are used to you. All right, uh, Regina, we appreciate your call. This is Creature Comforts on MPB Think Radio. We need to take this final break of the hour. When we get back, we'll continue our conversation with artist Robin Whitfield. Dr. Major's still on hand, and Liddy Hartfield's here. We want pet questions and encounters with nature like we do each week. Join the conversation with your phone call. It's one eight seven seven mpb ring Our phone number is one 672 7464 You can email animals at mpbonline.org. Back to wrap things up after this. This podcast is a local production of Mississippi Public Broadcasting and depends on the support of listeners like you. If you can, please donate today at mpbonline.org. And thanks. You're listening to Creature Comforts on MPB Think Radio. Kevin Farrell here with Dr. Troy Major and Libby Hartfield. And our guest for the hour is Robin Whitfield. So, Robin, uh, our caller from right before that last break was Regina. And you wanted a, a couple of comments based on what Regina had to say. Yeah, Regina, I just wanted to fully agree with you that I think seeing artists perform, dance, play music, uh, paint, and per- you know, watching them actually make, create things with their hands – is absolutely necessary to hone all of our... It helps hone us just like just sitting in front of... But you can sit in front of something beautiful in nature, and I don't think you can always see it if you haven't been sensitized to beauty. And I personally totally agree that having my artist mother take us take me to museums and, and watch... I like my neighbor, Wyatt Waters, I watched him paint every day, or at least every week, you know, in his yard or... That, that was very important. I just took it for granted. But, uh, yeah, it definitely sensitized me to be able to appreciate nature. Let's get one final call in this hour. Raymond has called in from Arkansas. Raymond, thanks for holding on. What do you have for us? Yes. I would just like to uh, get a clarification on the definition of naturalist uh, and, as opposed to uh, nature. Because it's... Uh, what I know is that uh, naturalist is one who studies uh, birds and animals, where a naturalist is one who uh, tends to be natural, naturally new. All right, uh, Raymond, thanks. Uh, kind of sounds like maybe interchangeable, uh, the terms. Uh, any thoughts from Libby or, or Robin? I, I think what he said there at the end... It, if you Google naturalist, you're going to get something very different oh, yeah. than when you Google naturist. I think that that, yeah, mm-hmm. that can be into a, a whole different realm. That, that so, can, yeah. Right. I'll stick with the naturalist, yeah, yeah. the study of nature, yes. Right, and I have yeah. a, you can, I, have, mm-hmm. I took the master naturalist course uh, back mm-hmm. in 2007 through Strawberry Plains Audubon Center, and so I'll just take the, the, the title they gave me. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> 
got a few minutes left. Uh, Robin, if you would, tell us a little bit about the Chakchuma Swamp and the Lee Tart Nature Preserve. Um, we spoke about it a little bit earlier. This is the 300 acres uh, right down from my studio in downtown Grenada. And um, I, so I have found myself in a unique position that I never envisioned uh, starting out uh, as a young painter out of, out of college. That I now have a nonprofit organization called Friends of Chakchuma Swamp. And I am the director of that organization, and uh, I now am leasing that 300 acres uh, through that organization and managing it and using it as, I'm going to say a classroom. Uh, You know, this is a place that um, in my organization, our mission is connecting people to nature with uh, creativity and curiosity. And I think, you know, if y'all have been listening to me talk this morning, I think that probably mission makes complete sense. But my my board, we, we do believe that in order to... Uh, really see nature, you have to feel comfortable there. So our organization has the twofold purpose of of taking care of Chakchuma Swamp, uh, which are old, which these are, this is a kind of a series of oxbows that were created by the Yalabusha River. We're about one mile uh, uh, down from the Grenada Lake Spillway. And you all know Grenada Lake's one of the largest lakes in the state and it was, uh, it's one of the lakes that um, was built in the 40s to help control water in the Yazoo River Basin in the Delta. So, uh, but there's a lot of public land uh, that has been left wild uh, as a part of this Grenada Lake complex, and Chakchuma Swamp, uh, which is within Lee Tart Nature Preserve, is um, is uh, you know within that quarter, with that less than a mile. You know, in other words, it's one big green area, and so it makes uh, it makes it have a. It's really special to have this that quality of wetland so accessible within the city limits in a downtown area. So we have lots of lots of field trips come garden clubs and school groups and a lot of homeschool groups. So we, um, we're about to have our first children's summer camp, um, summer discovery camp, this June, June, uh, in fact, 14th through 16th. It's just three mornings in a row, of 9 to 12-year-olds. But we're going to have uh, – we're actually – and going back to natural materials, it's um, – we've decided to, to – uh, each day we'll focus on a natural material, like mud will be one, like we've talked – we're still kind of just defined the grass and mud are probably going to be two for sure. But we're going to look at anything from how humans use mud, like for making bricks, or maybe the Chakchuma would have used it. Those were the native people, by the way, of, of the, the Yellowbush River, to form their, their – you know, they would make sort of weave a sort of a uh, – Mats and for, you know, clump mud around it to make sort of an adobe. Uh, that would would have been you know. So then you have your swallows and your crawfish and and uh, beavers using mud, you know. And then of course you can paint with mud. And then what is mud and how? Where did it come from? And you know, it's just a you can really dive deep into a place starting with a material. Same with grasses. You know, we can look at birds and insects and how you you know how just how different things are utilized. So that's. That's kind of what we try to do, whether it's an adult workshop or children workshop. We try to take one thing and help people see everything and how it's all connected. Uh, just a couple of seconds left, actually. So if folks were interested in the work that your nonprofit does, is there a, a Facebook page or any way that they could learn more information about it? Yeah, friends-of-cs.org. And we do have one other upcoming event, which I would really recommend people come to this. This is in, in next, not this weekend, but next weekend, April 30th, called Spring Wings. And it is a free event. We'll have canoes and kayaks uh out there uh, with uh, guides waiting to take you out on a little 20-minute tour and tell you a little bit about a Supalo Cypress Swamp. We're also going to have some experts in birding and other naturalists taking you on 20-minute walks uh, where you're really we're, we're celebrating all things with wings. All right. Good way to end the show. Creature Comforts is a production of Mississippi Public Broadcasting Think Radio, funding provided in part by listeners. If you need to hear today's show or a previous show, you can find it at creaturecomforts.mpbonline.org. Our show is produced by Java Chapman, and our call screener today was Liz Gill. So for Dr. Troy Major, Libby Hartfield, and our guest Robin Whitfield, I'm Kevin Farrell. Up next, it's AutoCorrect, and we're here every Thursday at 9 for Creature Comforts, only on MPB Think Radio.